Thank you, all the panel as well as chair. I think there was one point that was touched about the differentiation we need to make between the local people and people in power and the local level negotiation. Uh, I'm interested to know whether we are finding any common trends, what makes things work when it comes to local negotiation. And also, uh, Nick, you have been asking mostly questions, but you have also broken stories and you have come out with a lot of scoops in the past in some of these <laughs> locations. So is there anything we can learn from the media, how they negotiate access, which might be helpful for the humanitarian sector? I, I didn't expect any questions. That's a first. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, and then there was a question, I think, right up here. Let me just get, let's get two, and then we can try and distribute from there. Yeah, this uh, woman in the green dress. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's been a very interesting discussion. I was just really interested in trends, and um, I'm sorry, I'm Sarah Cor um, here from the ICRC, and uh, one thing that we very much <coughs> have realized that to gain acceptance you have to be understood, and to be understood you often have to be watched and observed on the ground to make sure that what you're saying you're doing is actually what you're doing, and that's obviously quite a time-consuming um, thing to, to try to achieve with a variety of actors. And um, I think, Ashley, you mentioned that um, in DRC in particular there is a proliferation of armed groups, but I know that's also certainly the case elsewhere, not least Afghanistan. And I wonder when there is a case when there is a lack of political progress and there is therefore more pressure on humanitarian organizations, this tendency for, um, for uh, the armed opposition to splinter and to, to there for, the, for there to be more and more groups, for an aid organization, there's therefore more and more people to convince of your worth or new, your neutrality. And whether this, this, this problem, this challenge, is something that really happens in, in a few key contexts or really is truly a global trend that we're seeing in every, everywhere where there is severe violence. Hmm. So let's, let's start with Ashley on, on those three or four questions, I think. So Ashley, why don't you, why don't you answer that one first, the, this kind of uh, lack of political progress, what happens with splintering, and also I, I just to combine two of those questions, trends in success. You know, what what are the examples that we've seen, not only in Afghanistan but elsewhere, of, of how to make these things work? Why don't you start, and then we'll we'll go around. Sure. Just to talk about um, the fragmentation around groups, I don't know that there's always a direct correlation between lack of political process and fragmentation of an armed group. Um, there's often a correlation between lack of political process and then a heavy reliance by donors and armed groups on humanitarian channels, on humanitarian aids. Uh, you see this again and again with certain conflicts where donors can't find a political solution and push through through aid, uh, regardless of uh, the, the conditions on the ground and whether or not it's it's appropriate to, to allocate that much aid uh, or put that much pressure on delivery. Somalia is a classic example. Um, what I would say in terms of fragmentation is that this is something uh, that you see in across contexts, waxes and wanes. Sometimes you have a united front that, again, Darfur is a very good example that splinters. In other areas, Afghanistan probably being a very good example, you see a move towards consolidation over time. Um, ASEAN groups have a, a more common agenda uh, and seek to seek to find ways to govern and work together and prepare for a post-conflict scenario. Um, but what I would say, I mean, and this is, I would say this unconditionally, is that it's more difficult to engage with numerous fragmented armed groups who are in competition with one another um, than it is, you know, a couple of armed groups that are, you know, fairly well structured and organized. And I think that's the concern with Syria, the last estimate I've seen is something like 12,000 different armed factions operational. Um, and indeed, ICRC issued a press release highlighting their concerns about having to engage with so many different armed groups and how difficult it was for them to talk to group after group or faction after faction in Syria. And quickly, Ashley, just, just also answer, I think, because I think you can answer this, the observations observing this on the ground, what, you know, what these groups are, are doing versus what they promise. Yeah, and this is something that's come up in our research in Sudan, Afghanistan, and Somalia, is that armed groups are highly sophisticated in general, um, where aid agencies are present in terms of monitoring and surveilling them whether it's a DRC and you have any number of armed groups uh, or whether or not it's 
it's Asha Bach and Somalia, they devote significant time, resources, and energy to monitoring what you're doing. So you better be doing what you're saying you're doing, especially if there's a suspicion of the armed group, um, a sense that they might be spies. So if there's any deviation from, from what you're saying, um, it can open up the aid agency or aid workers to attacks, threats, um, harassment. And what we saw in Afghanistan was you know, this deep-seated suspicion of aid agencies is that, well, why are they coming here? It's surely not out of, uh, of the good of their heart to help the Afghan people because they're not doing very good work. And the work that they're doing is not driven by needs. Plus, they're only in areas where there are international forces. So we know that their motivations aren't pure. Um, and so, <laughs> so you can see from that perspective, of course, that's, that's a skewed perspective, but why why that might not make sense if, if you're in a context not doing something that the community and armed actors as part of that community perceive as something that they need, uh, is in line with their values, and is actually effective. They're going to wonder what you're doing there. Um, so I think, I think that's the main point in terms of demonstrating um, that you add value and, and having a consistency between your work and presence on the ground and the messages that you're seeking to convey. Jerry, take take a stab at the the trends in success, and also, if if you don't mind, just because not not that I'm I'm deferring here, but I think it'd be interesting to hear from the panelists about what they think of of the influence of the media. So, Jerry, trends in success and influence of the media uh, on access or or on all all the issues we've been talking about. Very much on, on the trends. Uh, first of all. It's, it's the case, as Ashley said, that in, in different contexts, sometimes there, there can be fragmentation of different types of groups. What becomes very problematic is when outside actors, whether it's humanitarian organizations, whether it's states, whether it's those managing political processes, actually contribute to that fragmentation. And that certainly has happened in some cases, whereby running too fast to engage without really checking, and this goes to the gentleman who posed the first question, the link between the local people and the leaders or commanders, if it's a military group, in, in those groups. Organizations should not rush and take at face value because they're presenting themselves as those great influencers in an area that they actually are. They should always maintain a possibility to discuss, negotiate with the communities directly and not presume that some of these armed groups, groups in particular are represented. They may not have a constituency to start with in the first place. On the role of the media, I would focus in on one particular dimension there, which is that on some issues, the, the particularly non-state armed groups, they may seek to leverage or benefit from humanitarian negotiations, and they may actually go to the media or, or leverage that type of engagement. I've certainly seen been in situations where you feel somewhat hijacked that there's a photographer or even a video camera running and you're wondering is this going to be edited in a way that says this group did come and actually and actually legitimize or accord legitimacy to the group. So for the media in humanitarian negotiations, you can't control what other groups say to the media. You can certainly by your actions try as much as possible to demonstrate we're working in a particular way. We're engaged with all parties. And on some occasions, that requires some preemptive work with the media, in some cases, if you believe that that um, possibility is there. Last point of the trends, there is a trend towards integration, particularly in the context of UN-mandated peace operations. And in our view, that is absolutely going the wrong direction. We should be looking at separation, at least of roles, because the evidence on the ground does not support the benefits, particularly the humanitarian benefits of integrating humanitarian functions, objectives into a political development humanitarian mission. So as a trend, that is one that's rolling, but it's going in the wrong direction. Mm. There's a question uh, online from Kay. I'm going to get to that uh, in a minute. But I just wanted to see, get a couple more questions from the audience. Maybe we'll get three. Yeah. Uh, so let me start with this woman here. Thank you. Um, Irene Vag. Um, I'm currently an independent consultant researching um, women and children in conflict and, and also IDPs. But in my past life, I actually was head of an organization in northern Iraq during the um, 
the, the, the safe haven period and also just after the war. And so, um, well, first of all, I'd like to thank the panel for bringing these issues to the, to the front because they are so pertinent for what is going on in Syria at the moment. Um, if I can draw my experience in Kurdistan and, and reiterate what, what, what uh, Pascal has said, um, it, it is very difficult because in our day-to-day -day running of humanitarian aid programs, not only did we have the problems of being declared persona non grata by the, the government of Iraq, within Kurdistan itself, then at that time, there was conflict between the Barzani people and Talibani's people. And so for me, the problem of delivering humanitarian aid involved a lot of diplomacy and, and walking through a political minefield. You, you, I found that the most useful way was to, was to remain impartial and, and to reiterate your impartiality through your activities. And so programs that were developed at the time and funded were shared equitably between the three governorates of the Hook, um, Abil, and Sulaymaniyah. And, and, and that um, key staff did shared their time um, also equitably between the, th the three governorates. Um, we forget that um, also NGOs uh, at the time had a problem of legitimacy because we, we were not allowed to be there. Uh, and therefore, you could only be there if you were under the umbrella of the UN coordination. And so long as the UN coordination offices were allowed to, to be there and the importance of coordination. I, I don't want to interrupt. I, I just want, yeah. I want to get to as many questions as possible. Okay. So I just want you to wrap up if you could. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what, what I would say is, is, is that it is a minefield. Um, that, that coordination is important, that the Syrian sh situation should not invite a swarm of NGOs who don't have experience in dealing with diverse political situations because they can do more harm than they can do good. But coordination is key. Okay, Thank you. Great. There, there's a question, I think, back in the back row there. Thank you. Um, my name is David Newton. I work for Conciliation Resources, which is a, a peace building <coughs> organization, and we support peace processes in about nine different places around the world. Um, so, my kind of, I'm used to conversations about engagement with on groups from a more political perspective, and I guess that's what I kind of want to interrogate a bit more and just hear a few perspectives on. Because um, I think we've heard quite clearly arguments about the distinct nature of humanitarian negotiation and also some quite clear calls to keep that separate from political discussions. And I can certainly understand that in many contexts, and, and particularly where um, the political negotiations are often tied to belligerents in the same conflict, so such as Afghanistan. But I think there are also many different types of peace process around the world, um, some of which are less closely tied to kind of global strategic issues, some of which there are more kind of neutral facilitators, um, organizations such as ourselves, as many others work in our field. Um, and you have a more genuinely neutral facilitative process, which is, which is encouraging dialogue between groups. And often, I think we find that humanitarian... Sorry, sorry I'm getting that the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> humanitarian um, dialogue can be a very interesting first step to leading towards political negotiation. We heard this from, from Hamas, for example, who are, who are wanting to use that channel, perhaps because it's the only channel that exists, to start testing political questions. So I suppose what I'm looking for are some yeah. comments about some more nuance around how you link humanitarian and political and peace yeah. negotiations. Very good question. And um, just, just one here, sorry, we'll get to you. Just one more here. Uh, just wait for the microphone, because otherwise people won't be able to hear. Hi there, yes. I'm Simajit Kaur. Um, I work for TAR, and we've been um, aiding in a post-conflict situation in the Punjab um, for the last 10 years. And with, um, my question is really regarding um, how we defend um, hu uh, humanitarian aid activists post-conflict, um, I know you're very much dealing with uh, conflict right now and conflict situations, and because when we're operating in India, it is the world's largest democracy, and because we're operating in an area of impunity, um, I actually find that the dissident groups are able to provide us with access to victims, but it's actually the state itself, um, sort of finding legitimacy within that has become a very, very long process, and I've approached sort of UN women downwards, upwards, left, right, center, and got mentoring for, from Physicians for Human Rights USA. So um, to the uh, panel here, 
because they're, they've worked in very diverse, dangerous situations, I'd appreciate, you know, what can uh, humanitarian aid workers do to legitimize themselves further, especially if they're not under a major sort of UN type group? Thank you. Oh, okay, so let's just try and uh, take these quickly, guys. Pascal, why don't you start with political minefield uh, and how that works for humanitarian actors, or, or if you'd rather answer one of the other questions, feel free. <laughs> and then we can come. Actually, I see the you second want to take one. that one? Sure. Okay, yes, um, because we have some experience, and I, I would agree that perhaps we we have a more nuanced uh, experience of, of, of the whether or not uh, we should totally disconnect or separate human engagement with political engagement or peace engagement. As you said, I think we found that in some countries, um, the fact that we were dealing on a limited issue was really an entry point, a port d'entrée, to facilitate some contacts between two parties and build confidence. And i just give the example again of Sudan, South Sudan, and uh, Khartoum. Uh, in 2002, we were able to bring together the government representatives and the SPLA representative with UNMAS, and I'm happy to, to see Mr. Uh, Martin Barber, who was the head of UNMAS at that time, the UN Mine Action uh, uh, service and to basically agree on a memorandum of understanding on mine action, cooperation in mine action between the two parties with the UN involvement. And as a result of that, there were mine action centers created in both Humbeck at that time, it was the, the capital of the SPLA uh, controlled territory, and Khartoum. And I think this type of human agreements or engagement really helped to build confidence between the two parties, and I think that paved the way, among many other things. Mm. Uh, to the CPA, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, that uh, was signed uh, three years later in 2005. Um, at the same time, um, we also sometimes take advantage of political uh, processes of mediation to meet with the different uh, armed non-state actors. I think that when there is a ceasefire, it's really a window of opportunity for human engagement. Um, to also build confidence or support from the concerned government, because it means that he has recognize the legitimacy of the armed non state actors interlocutor when they meet for political issues. So it helped us, I think, uh, to, to engage uh, more effectively with armed non state actors. The, the downside of that is um, when there is some organization try to promote the inclusion of humanitarian uh, issues or rules into peace agreements, which is good in itself, but if the peace agreement fails, then the humanitarian commitment by both parties mm -hmm. fails uh, as well. And that was the case, for example, in Burundi in 2002. Uh, there was a ceasefire agreement that included some uh, humanitarian provisions between the main Hutu rebellion at that time, the Sindhi, the FDD, and the government. That failed, and then the, the rebellion told us clearly that we don't feel bound uh, no longer with both the peace agreement and the humanitarian commitment. So I think to link the two issues is also sometimes problematic, and there should be, I think, a separate uh, engagement process for you to issues. Mm. Let me go to Tony now. Um, Tony, have, have we distinguished too much between the political and humanitarian? The gentleman's question was, can humanitarian negotiations lead to political negotiations? Um, I think there's a, an assumption at times, both by non-state armed actors and by certain political groups or states, that that can be the case. So. Um, Right in the article, the situation here, and as I mentioned, Hamas very much wants to use its engagement on humanitarian issues and with the humanitarian community to gain political recognition and to start uh, political engagement by Western states that have so far have enlisted as a terrorist and have listed several demands that they uh, meet before they're, before they're willing to engage with them. Um, and from the position of the international community, they very much see this as well. They oftentimes will take uh, Hamas's approach to the humanitarian community as a barometer of their moderation, their pragmatism, um, and looking for nuances in the changes of their approach and positions vis-a-vis -vis Israel, the use of violence, um, and engaging in a political process. And so it can help provide the basis for facilitating towards a political process if it does reflect a kind of behavior and approach that um, seems to be what is needed from one or the other parties enable, to enable them to engage. Um, so it can kind of be a transition in that uh, direction. Um, 
But on the other hand, I agree with Gerard, that there is a big concern at conflating these two issues together. And it's something that we see in the OPT all the time and mentioned briefly before in that with a lack of political progress, oftentimes the international community, political actors will turn to humanitarian issues and use them as a sort of confidence building measures to restart the political process. And again, that oftentimes will limit the ability of making progress on humanitarian issues to a political agenda, one here that's extremely difficult and extremely deadlocked. And so it essentially limits our ability to make progress on humanitarian issues because it's tied to what most see as a very dead political process. Um, so it can help tr transition, but again, it really depends on the context and the willingness of both parties and under what conditions they're willing to engage in that political process. Quickly, Jerry, have you ever been in a political minefield and how do you make sure you don't step in the wrong place? Well, I'd, I'd call up Pascal and then the uh, deed of commitment if I was in a political minefield. But <laughs> in any case, um, very first, let, let us say that, of course, humanitarian negotiations by bringing types of parties together, yes, can build trust, can build confidence. What we see as being most problematic is when there's a tie-in or a hardwiring of humanitarian objectives with political objectives, that becomes problematic. <clears throat> if the political process does not include all of the parties that you need to be engaging with for the purpose of humanitarian negotiations, which is very much the case in, in, um, in Somalia at different times. Certainly also there, there's a challenge. Somalia is a very good example where the former transitional federal government, the TFG, which ended its term in August 2012, was being actively supported by the United Nations. And then at the same time, elements of the UN system or family are trying to position themselves as neutral to al-Shabaab and others. That's why in those types of situations, it is very important to have that separation. But certainly also, just on conciliation resources question, of course, conciliation resources, I think it's 2004, had a conference of non-state armed groups where the non-state armed groups themselves said, yes, we see humanitarian negotiations at a good entry point. Of course they would. They're seeking in many cases to get that political legitimacy. That does not mean it's the best approach for humanitarian outcomes. Hmm. Um, I'm going to come back to you and I think a few other questions in the room. But quickly, Ashley, there's a question from online. Uh, Kay, I apologize, I do not know how to pronounce your last name. Kay Gwenain, or Gwenan, who's the director of Charity and Security Network in the States. Uh, Ashley, have a go at this. Uh, it's a question regarding the impact of U.S. legal restrictions on humanitarian actors. Does the no-contact policy that we talked about earlier in Gaza appear also to be the policy in Syria, Somalia, and other places where there are groups that are on the U.S. terror list? Uh, and, and how does that how does that contribute, or how does that impact uh, access to civilians and access to humanitarian uh, work? Yeah, I and mean, we touched a little bit on no-contact policies and, and the damaging effects they've had in, in Gaza, but. This question seems to be specifically about U.S. counter-terror legislation. I think um, that illustrates some of the challenges around this in a very specific way. So U.S. counter-terror legislation is incredibly unevenly enforced. So the same kinds of restrictions you have in Somalia, which aid agencies are very, very conscious of in terms of al-Shabaab or, or other listed terrorist entities, um, you know, there, there are listed terrorist entities in Afghanistan, but aid agencies don't seem to fear the repercussions as much because uh, there's been much less attention, there's been much less uh, subsequent regulation within donor policy. So it's really unevenly enforced. So no, you don't see um, the same sort of uh, attention or um, fear of consequences across uh, different countries. And I think that underscores a real difficulty with the counter-terror legislation post 9-11 is that not not that no contact is a new thing uh, since the dawn of humanitarian negotiations I think there have been donors and host governments that have tried to limit humanitarian agencies from talking to armed groups for fear that they might legitimize them or for other concerns but post 9-11 with counter-terror you you've seen a rise in in bureaucratic uh, regulations and, and processes which have placed a really heavy burden on aid agencies and just in terms of pure paperwork. 
Uh, there have also been concerns about the information that agencies have been asked to provide, uh, whether it's beneficiary lists uh, or information, very sensitive information that they're, they're gathering through their programs, which you know, agencies then fear could be used um, as part of you know, the Durham government's political efforts or to feed military intelligence and so on. Um, so I think it's, it's an incredibly difficult problem, and part of that difficulty Kay touches on is that it's really ambiguous. There's a lot of confusion, and it's really unevenly enforced. Mm. Uh, let's go back to the room. Uh, please keep comments to a minimum, questions witty and, and direct. So I think there was one here, and yeah, we'll get to as many as we can over here, and I might just take all of them, basically, and, and we'll just... Distribute. Uh, John Danzig, I'm a medical journalist, and my question may seem rather naive in response to what seems an entrenched and very intellectually challenging problem. But whether they become, whether they come before the bombs or after the bombs, we know that negotiations, humanitarian and political, are going to happen. They're going to have to happen. But how do we persuade the world and promote the cause of negotiations before the bombs? Because America, their response always seems to be, "Let's drop the bombs first. Even Churchill, the warlord, said, George or is better than war, war. <laughs> yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Eloise Rudel, and I'm a consultant for Geneva Core. I had a, a question about the content and the objective of human, so-called humanitarian negotiations, because we use it a lot, but sometimes it feels it's, it's a bit of a generic term. And uh, there seems to be a consensus on the need for access, on addressing immediate humanitarian needs. But when it comes when it comes to encouraging more protective behavior by um, non-state actors, I think here is 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 where um, we hit hit an area which is more sensitive, and where the behavior and policies of organizations are. Uh, inconsistent and some organizations are even choosing not to engage because of various policies including what we've discussed already on the no contact but but also also because it's it's the domain of the political or something which which we didn't touch on uh, because it's it is sometime about addressing the root causes of what may be the cr crisis and looking at long-term issues and we may need to look at, at human rights issue. And when we talk about human rights, the general feeling and perception is that it's the responsibility of the states. And there's way less room. There is room in IHL for um, non-state actors, but one not so much when it comes to human rights framework. Thank Great. you. I think uh, one or two down there. Did I miss any down here? No. Keep your hand up if uh, she hasn't seen you. Hi, my name is Aul Kulumbe, and I'm from Jubaland Diaspora. Uh, and I've been candidate for Jubaland State of Somalia, but I just turned on. Anyway, my question is, um, since there is a suspicion on aid workers inside where the jobs needed, is there a role for the diaspora communities from different countries to fill those vacancies? Most of them are educated in the West. I've been living here for the last 20 years, for example, from Somalia. There's a lot of uh, educated uh, in the West who are living here, and they can fill that vacancy. And at the same time, aid can be reached to where it needed. Thank you very much. And was there one more? Uh, no. OK, great. Um, OK, uh, and I apologize. You can feel free to answer a different question than I'll ask you to, to answer. But Tony, how do you promote diplomacy before the bombs drop? <laughs> That's a very good question. And I'm not sure I have a response for it. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that I've seen in the experience in the OPT and other examples is, unfortunately, the way to get that engagement before the bombs drop is only after a president being set of the bombs being dropped and having that engagement not having taken place prior and everyone understanding the repercussions of it. So essentially lessons learned from past mistakes where you have gone in with bombs first and then tried to negotiate humanitarian conditions afterwards. Um, the effectiveness of the humanitarian response and humanitarian negotiations during uh, the military operation that took place in November 2012 was very much the result of lessons learned both by the humanitarian community 
uh, and Hamas as a non-state actor in Gaza, as well as the Israeli military from uh, Operation um, Cast Lead back in 2008, 2009. There's a very ineffective, there wasn't much engagement on contingency access during armed hostilities prior to that armed conflict. During the conflict, the results of that were very clear. There was no effective coordination mechanisms. There was no effective channel for humanitarian negotiations to get essential staff in, uh, essential supplies in, and non-essential staff out. Um, that was seen in terms of attacks on, excuse me, humanitarian facilities inside of Gaza, um, injuries of humanitarian organizations, and limited access to and from and within Gaza during that operation. So as a result of the problems that we saw there, People worked very hard in the subsequent years prior to 2012 to put in place those mechanisms and systems to be able to have effective humanitarian negotiations. And working through humanitarian negotiations to create communication channels, to create understandings of access routes, temporary uh, pauses and hostilities, or how to uh, conduct humanitarian corridors uh, during armed hostilities. And so a lot of that preparation that took place in the three years prior to the operation um, was very helpful. So I think in, in other examples as well, it's very much seeing the negative ramifications of not having that engagement prior, which helps people see the need to do so in uh, later circumstances. I think that's, <clears throat> that's a very important point. Jerry, uh, role for diaspora. I think in, on, the, on the role of, for example, in Somalia, which I didn't hear correctly, but I believe the gentleman who posed the question is, is from the Somali diaspora, if I heard correctly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that being the case, the types of roles there include, for example, the remittance possibilities that are there. In some countries, the diaspora can play an incredibly important role in advocating for change with the governments, particularly if they're influential states, they can play a role there. In the Sri Lanka example, it was actually engaging with the diaspora to help see what are the possibilities, as the question came earlier, what can you do to actually prevent or resolve a conflict? So I think in that, in the, in the realm of what can be done from the diaspora, yes, a role in the countries in which they're residing, in encouraging, advocating in that way. And of course, we see that the remittances, and Somalia with Dabshi and others, it's incredible. I think it probably dwarfs the um, much of the humanitarian the, the, the volume or value of humanitarian assistance. So in that way, there is a role, but um, I don't think I can add any more than that. Uh, maybe the gentleman can illuminate. Uh, I'm just, I'm gonna come back to your question in one second. Very quickly, Ashley, I just wanna get to this, this last one before we answer that, because I think that's a nice place to end. Ashley, very quick question uh, online from Frederick Pinard, the Director of Operations uh, at Solidarities. What about the legal risk when engaging with non-state actors that are illegal, uh, and the person refers to Colombia specifically. Do you have any notion of, of the legal risk to people engaging <clears throat> with groups that are illegal? Um, I can't speak very well to Colombia, and I assume he's talking about uh, the FARC. Um, but in general, I mean, this is, this is a difficulty time and time again. Um, often these groups are banned. Uh, early on in the conflict, uh, throughout the conflict, uh, up until perhaps and even after uh, they begin to engage in some sort of peace negotiations. So you're going to face, if you don't face a legal ban, whether it's from the national government, the other side of the, of the conflict, if you will, whether it's from donors in, in some form, whether it's counter-terror legislation or something else, or uh, whether they fall on a UN sanctions list, uh, which of course presents all sorts of problems in terms of the things Jerry was talking about, about the international system and the need for independent humanitarian leadership that doesn't uh, lead to conflations of UN humanitarian and, and political sides. If you don't face a legal restriction, you're gonna face a lot of resistance. You're gonna face accusations that of course you are talking to terrorists. Um, this is nothing new. This is something that the ICRC has had to face since Algeria, <laughs> where the ICRC played a really revolutionary role in, in engaging with an independence movement that later later came to power and were no longer terrorists, but a, but a governing body. Um, so this is the classic dilemma of negotiations, is that by engaging with all sides necessary to, to, to gain access, you're going to open yourself up to, negotiation, uh, to accusations of partiality. Uh, of taking the rebel side. Um, but the truth is, is that 
you know, the most effective way to combat such uh, accusations, perceptions, is to insist on, you know, as in international humanitarian law, as in humanitarian principles, the need to engage independently, impartially, and neutrally with all belligerents in a conflict for the objective of ultimately benefiting populations in need of assistance and protection. Um, and to do that consistently, to do that transparently, um, and to stick to that throughout the conflict. And which is, which is the perfect segue, thank you, Ashley, uh, to our last <laughs> question, and, and just, just to go back to her, and I think Ashley made it in part, with Pascal, to you, <clears throat> to paraphrase you very simply, what's the point? That is there room in international humanitarian law, as she asked, to influence our non-state actors? Yes, I think uh, the experience has shown that there is some point and even some progress um, in uh, or, or case in, in, in trying to promote IHL uh, towards uh, armed non-state actors. I think often armed non-state actors are portrayed as the main perpetrators, and they are in many cases. But uh, if you take the Guatemala example, for example, the investigation made after the conflict showed that 93% of the violations were committed by arm uh, by the armed forces and not the the rebellion or the armed movement. So I think it's, it's more nuanced than that. Uh, and of course, not all armed non-state actors uh, abide or agree to abide by international law, or no, they act in good faith towards the commitments, but I think they can, and this is the point you made at the beginning, contribute to the protection of civilians. They have a role, and I think, uh, it's, of course, there are many challenges in engaging with armed non-state actors, but the, the need, the case for engagement has been more and more, I think, uh, recognized by the international community They've in a series of resolution. Uh, the Secretary General report on the protection of civilians also acknowledge the need to engage with armed non-state actors. And there, there is a really a good, I think, well-established normative basis for, for this work. Article 3 uh, to the Geneva Convention also provide a ground uh, for, for engagement by giving the, the right to impartial military organization to engage with all parties to uh, armed conflict, including armed non-state actors. So I think uh, not engaging with armed non-state actors will only encourage repressive approaches, uh, radicalized uh, behaviors, and I think uh, basically missed opportunities for, for, for change. And I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Um, you guys, everybody has a little time to network uh, with Pascal, or I guess you could we could try and network with Ashley, Tony, and, and everybody, although that might be difficult. Um, but, but thank you so much for your participation, for being a great audience. Uh, and thank you to Jerry, to Tony, to Ashley, and Pascal. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, right. Uh, I have announcements. Uh, sorry. I've, all right. What am I supposed to announce? Um, the video recording will be available in a few days. Uh, just go to our website. Uh, refreshments will be provided there in the lobby where we'll be doing some networking. And don't forget the next event, October the 2nd, uh, about Sudan and Darfur. So thank you very much uh, again, everyone.